Let's open with a word of prayer this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives life. And Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our helper, our teacher, our comforter, and our guide. And so, Father, as we just take a few moments to study your word, we thank you for, for wisdom, knowledge, and, and Father, that this something will be deposited in each one of our hearts that would just be rhema and that we can walk away changed today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, I've been promising this for a while. You know, we, we, we studied jealousy, and really jealousy could almost be um, uh, a precursor to what we're going to be studying in the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at money. Money. And I've titled this series, I Don't Want Your Money. Why did we title it, I Don't Want Your Money? Because anytime the preacher starts talking about money, what's the first thing that people think all the church wants is my money? All that God wants is my money. So I want you to understand that I'm not teaching this series because we want your money. And so um, we're going to be looking for this next several weeks at finances and what God has to say. He has a lot to say about it. <clears throat> and we do injustice sometimes when we try to steer away from the topics that, that, that are important to each and every one of us. And money and finances uh, are an avenue of life. So uh, in this sermon this morning, uh, I, I want to help establish that God is the owner of everything. That is, He is the one who gives. He is the one who gives us the ability to earn an income. And also that we must keep money in its proper perspective. And so, you know, several years ago, uh, a Madison Avenue advertising agency surveyed non-church going people and asked them their impression of church. Asked them their impression of church. And so here's the summary that they came up with of what the respondents said. The problem with church is that people are always sad and they talk about death or they ask for money. Now, this was a national survey of non-church people. And that kind of goes along the lines of the classic joke I heard one time. And it kind of goes something like this. A mother of a young boy calls to her husband hysterically. Honey, quickly call the doctor. Johnny just swallowed a coin. Henry replies, I think we should call the preacher instead of the doctor. Wife looks surprised. Why call the preacher? The husband replies, the preacher can get money out of anybody. <laughs> In response to these prevailing attitudes about churches, many churches today are, up, are upbeat, and they don't say much about death, and they don't really bro broach the subject, and some would call it the offensive subject of money. We want to always talk about what's happy, always talk about what's encouraging, but we fail if we don't teach the entire counsel and word of God. And if you've been around His Grace Church for very long, then you know that we don't talk about money all the time, do we? But we do talk about it. And I believe that because we are people of the book, we are people of the book, aren't we? We believe what the Bible has to say. Then when we study the Bible, the Bible talks about money, and it talks about money a whole lot. Excuse me a moment. Excuse me, thank you. And it <clears throat> got a little raspy in my throaty. <laughs> that makes lots of sense. <laughs> Nothing like having your personal cheerleader right up front. So the Bible talks about money a whole lot. But did you know because of the dangers and, cha and the challenges uh, inherent in money and because of human nature, Jesus talked about money more than any other single topic. Single topic. Jesus talked about money more than any other single to topic. And for this reason, without apology, I want us to spend several weeks then exploring what the Bible has to say about money and how to use it. Now some of you say, well, I know how to use it. <laughs> My wife or husband earns it, and I spend it. 
Well, that, we're going to look at biblical principles of finances that, that will help us. So, I'm calling this series, again, I Don't Want Your Money. And you get the title, right? <laughs> I Don't Want Your Money. And within this series, we'll be looking at what the Bible says about earning, spending, borrowing, saving, and giving. And by way of introduction, let me share three common ideas or approaches uh, to money that have been taught in Christian circles, in churches. Two of, the, two of the approaches have led to confusion and, and, and could be incorrect conclusions. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong, but it doesn't mean that everything about it is right either. And, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up in a denomination and we were taught... Uh, what, what I would call maybe the poverty theology. Poverty theology. What is that? It's just people who believe or teach that we should hate material possessions and things, and that it's wrong to have money or material possessions. And, you, you know, by having these things, you're de denying your holiness and righteousness, and, you know, you suffer for Jesus, and you show the world how Jesus loves you by uh, denying yourself some of the pleasures of the world monetarily does that make sense no you just deny yourself you stay poor when you have the opportunity to earn decently and you give everything away you don't you don't have any of your uh, natural possessions um, and it's better to be poor than it is to have substance and that's how you show that you're spiritual is you're so poor that everybody else has to take care of you. And that's, that's not what I consider a sound doctrine. Though I think there is self-sacrifice, and there are things that we do that we, we can deny ourselves, that we don't always have to have everything that's out on the market. Well, some of us don't have to have everything that's out on the market today that's brand new. So there is self-denial, but living in poverty to show that Jesus is your Lord, I don't think proves uh, a, a correct doctrine. Then, the, then we have the other side, and that is, some people call it the prosperity gospel, where all of us are going to be millionaires. I don't see that in the Word either. Though, let me say this, I think, you know, there is a part of the poverty theology and a part of the prosperity theology that we can come to a balanced position in. I do believe that the Bible says God wants us to be rich. Rich to me may be different than rich to you. Rich to somebody may be Donald Trump, but for me, rich is having all my bills paid and something in the bank. And that means that maybe I may, I'm, if I only make $1,000 a month, but I got money in savings, all my bills are paid, all my needs are met, I'm rich. Doesn't mean that I have to be a millionaire and drive a Rolls Royce and show everybody I'm rich. No, rich is only... Uh, productive or it's it, it's I don't know how to say this um, rich is um, man I don't have the words to say to each person it's the definition of rich is different and to me rich is just having my needs met having money in the bank being able to do what I want to do and enjoy life to the fullest you know rich to some people is debt free and so, there is a balance to both sides. And some teach that poverty and spirituality are one and the same. And then again, on the opposite extreme, there are those that, that teach that, you know, we have the millionaire prosperity gospel. I believe God wants to bless us. He wants to mature us. He wants to increase us. But... He doesn't want us sitting on the couch eating bonbons and he does all the work. He's not your sugar daddy. He's our father. And our father teaches us and instructs us in the ways of the kingdom and causes us to grow. I remember my dad throughout the years, you know, as I grew, more was required of me. More information came, but more was required of me until I became a productive adult. Now, I didn't be really, you know, I was, just because I turned 18 doesn't mean I was a productive adult. So age doesn't, 
age doesn't come into play when you become productive is when you take the knowledge that has been imparted to you and begin acting on it. The Bible says in James to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And many times all we do is hear and hear and hear and hear and we put no action to what we're hearing so there's no growth and there's no development. For us to be productive citizens in the kingdom of God, we're going to have to grow and we're going to have to develop and we're going to have to put to practice what we're being taught. And many times, not many times, but sometimes, you know, <clears throat> We're taught on one end or we hear on the other end, but there's always a middle ground and there's always balance. And when it comes to money and when it comes to God, there's, there's a, a, a balanced arena. There's a middle ground. You can take the poverty theology, you can take the prosperity theology, and you can bring it in the middle and you're going to have a balanced theology. Does that make sense? So, am I against prosperity? No. Do I believe God wants to bless you? Yes. Am I against being poor? Oh, heck yeah. Been poor. I know what it's like not to have anything. Poor, I, if, it's, if it's the prosperity side or the poverty side, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to err on the prosperity side. Trust me, it's much better. Kim and I have been so poor that, you know, they say, well, we were under the barrel. No, we were dug deep in the basement of the barrel. Every so often you tip it up just to see if it was still light outdoors. But, you know, God is well able to make all grace abound to you that you having all sufficiency, the Bible says, am able to give unto every good work. And so as you begin to, to allow the, the principles of God to work in your life, there will come increase. The problem with increase is that we want it now. We want to be rich today. We want the extreme right this moment. We want to give the penny and get the thousand dollars. Because the Bible says given, it shall be given unto you. But we have to understand that there's principles to follow. And so, as we begin to develop and grow, we follow the principles of God. And I believe in the seed time and harvest principles. I believe the Word of God. I also believe that there's balance to everything. And as I just said a moment ago, God is not a get-rich, scheming God. God wants to bless you beyond measure. He wants to make sure that you're satisfied. He wants to give you a good life here on the earth. But what sometimes, though, what we, what we get is a portions of, of different teachings, and when we do that, we misconstrue it and we take everything out of balance. So this morning, I want you to understand that even though we're talking about money, that there is a balance. There is a balance in the kingdom of God. There's a balance in the kingdom of finances. You know, as I said, I believe in the prosperity gospel. But, you know, I came up in the 80s. And in the 80s, we were part of what they called the name it and claim it bunch. All we had to do was just say it and it would come to pass. I was young. I didn't know anything. And, you know, I believed everything. And, you know, God honored some of that faith because it was the faith that began to began to grow in me to believe and trust God for better. You know, I, I went off to Bible school and I about starved. I mean, some of you look at me today and say, you don't look like you're starving. You should have seen me in college. I was thin as a rail, 170 pounds. I was a head stuck on a neck with some shoulders. And that was it. I wasn't the well-rounded individual I am today. But through a process of years of trusting God, believing God, applying the principles of God, increase came. And, you know, it all came, the truth of what I learned back in those days, especially when I didn't have much, trusting and believing God, I learned and then applied along with common sense. That doesn't mean that there were times where there were some of those teachings that I really liked <laughs> that were a little maybe out there that, you know, almost like a get rich scheme. But, you know, we're going to we'll at least try it because if it works, <laughs> woo! But again, we have to come back to common sense and balance. And again, saying, you know, the truth of what I learned in the early part of my time of, of developing and applying those truths along with common sense has allowed Kim and I to enjoy some, some of what 
we are today, and some would even call the prosperity message. Prosperity is relevant and different for each of us depending on where and what you have in life or where you're at at that point in time. So I do believe that the Bible teaches prosperity in context. And in our series, we'll be looking toward what I could call or would call balanced theology. We're going to look at a balanced or proper theology. And what we're going to discover throughout the series is that the proper way to view our possessions is that they've been entrusted to us by God and that we are given the responsibility, notice that word, responsibility to manage them. Manage them. We'll also discover that ultimately God is the owner of everything, right? So that's a good place to start, right? God owns everything. Everything belongs to God. The Bible tells us that God is the maker of heaven and earth. So if he's the maker of heaven and earth, he's the owner of heaven and earth, right? That would be the simple assumption. So there's hardly anything more clear in the Bible than God's absolute right to everything. His absolute right to everything. To Job, God declares this. In Job chapter, Job chapter 41, verse 11, he says, Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. And then Psalms chapter 24 and verse 1 reads, The Lord, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That's beginning to show us that, man, he owns pretty much everything. In Haggai chapter 2 and verse 8, he says that the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. And my wife thought the gold was hers. <laughs> uh, no, it's the Lord's. He gave it to her. Then he goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, and he's trying to make the point that none of us should take pride in ourselves or boast about what we have accomplished for this reason. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, For who makes you different from anyone else? Who do you have or what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did and if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? So, we must understand that everything then, according to what we just read, originates with and is from God. Everything is His, and He distributes things as He's decided. You know, sometimes that, that makes it all think, well... God's the one that's going to make sure that you either are or you ain't. But, you know, when you look at it, God gives us the ability to get wealth, it says in Deuteronomy. What we do with that, you know, we know the story about the, um, the, the, the master who went off and gave his servants um, the opportunity uh, to invest and to bring additional and uh, wealth back into the, into the household by investing what he gave them. And two did and one didn't. And the one that just didn't do anything with what was given to him was the one that got into trouble. He said, I would, I would have preferred you, had, you know, the, the, what I gave you, I entrusted to you that you would have lost it and did something with it than not done anything at all. And sometimes God gives us gifts and things and abilities and resources to provide for our homes and we don't do anything with it. In fact, we despise it. We talk down. We think that God should do more for us. And God gives us the ability to, to get wealth or to increase our wealth. And that is so true because as we, as we go through life, if you look, some of us who are older, you look back, you just see the hand of God, how he's guided your profession and how increases have come and how raises and promotions have come. In fact, we used to make those statements, raises and promotions come. And you know, other people aren't getting them, but you are. Why? Because God gives the increase. Amen? But you have to be willing to work. You, when, I, when I went to Bible school, the first question they asked us on the first day of seminary was, how do you spell ministry? Well, man, you know, we didn't have spell check back then, but I was pretty sure I got that right. M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y. And uh, he said, nope, you're wrong. I said, 
Well, wouldn't surprise me, you know, spelling wasn't my high end. <laughs> he said, the way you spell ministry is W-O-R-K. But that's really the essence of life. So often we think all we have to do is sit on our laurels and everything will be handed to us and we're going to do well. And it's not true. We have to apply ourselves. We have to use the gifts and talents God's given us. We have to grow. We have to develop. We have to continue moving forward, even in our educational process for our jobs, because technology is changing every day. And if you don't think that's true, you know, look, at, look how far we've come in just 10 years just on the Internet. Man, I remember, <laughs> I remember when 26.6 was, you, you dialed in and connected to the Internet and it was 26.6, and man, you thought, that's high speed. And then when they came out with 48.8, man, woo! You were, you were flying high. Now I think if I don't get a gig, it's slow. You know, we, we, we operate with far less here, and man, I do everything at the house because <laughs> my kids wouldn't even know what to do if they had to dial in. <laughs> <laughs> You had that sound, remember that sound it used to make? And then you knew, and then click, you knew you were connected. Man, and man, to, to, to just to download a kilobyte, whoo, boy, took four hours. My first computer I ever saw was 40 megabytes. Her father had it. He was so proud he built it himself. It was 40 megabytes. Oh, megabytes. Man, we're dealing with terabytes now. What the? So everything belongs to God. All right. So we must understand that everything originates with God and is from God. Everything is his and he distributes things as he directs. So. With that, don't you think, don't you think that this should help us to have more of a humble disposition and to be less possessive and less anxious about the things we have received? Sometimes we just get. Too, I don't want to use the word too haughty. Look at me. Look what I got. Look at the nice car. Look at this. Look at that. Look at these nice clothes. I did all this myself. And really, you know, I think about all the things that I've got and how God's hand was involved in getting them for me. So God's ownership of everything also changes the kind of questions we should be we should ask about giving. Sometimes rather than asking how much money should I give to the church? How much money should I give to, to God? He wants everything. Maybe we should just learn to ask, how much of God's money should I keep for myself? He owns it all. He gave you the ability. He gave you the opportunity. I mean, if we look at it, it belongs to God, and he's just given a stewardship of it. Man, I think his resources are unlimited. Unlimited. Limitless. His resources are unlimitless. And so... But we're going to go into giving in a later teaching. Um, but for now, I just want us to understand and appreciate the fact that everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God, and God gives us the ability to earn money. Rather than, rather than to teach that it's wrong this morning to have money, the Bible actually teaches that God gives us the ability to earn income. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, we see the story of God when he was reminding the Israelites not to forget him, nor, for, nor to forget that it was him, God, who has not only given them what they have, but also the ability to get more. It was God that gave them the ability to get more. And then in verse 18, they are told, but remember the Lord your God, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, it says, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Another translation says to get wealth. It's him who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Additionally, not only does God give us the ability to earn an income, the Bible teaches that God expects us to do so. He expects us to do so. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23, we read, All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk only leads to poverty. Notice that all hard work brings a profit but mere talk leads only to poverty you know i don't i don't know about you but i'm sure we've all known some people who never get around to working 
and earning a living, haven't we? I know people who are, are going to make excellent supervisors someday. Because as you're working, they, they like to stand there and tell you how to do it and talk to you. <laughs> so, but let, let, let's look at Paul's instructions to the Christians in, in Thessalonica when he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. He says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands just as we told you to do so. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and that you will not be dependent on anybody. So when Paul wrote this, when Paul wrote in his second letter to Thessalonians, he also added these words, Thess no, Thessalonians, Thessalonica. Well, you, you ever have those big words that some days, you know, you practice and you practice, it comes out perfect. And then all of a sudden your tongue just wraps around it. Today's the day. <laughs> but when Paul wrote... Uh, in 2 Thessalonians, he added these words concerning work. He said, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teachings you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. For we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we work night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. So let's add to that what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. He says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Well, that's pretty strong, isn't it? Let's look at another example. Now you see why we don't talk about finances very often in the church. But let's look at another example in Ephesians chapter Four and verse 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. You see, from all these verses, we learn that God expects that each of us to use the abilities that he has given us to earn a living. Every able body and able minded person should work, should work. And those who are disabled, well, they can do all they can do to receive the help that's available to them. So, if you are able, body, and minded, you should what? Work. How do you spell work? M-I-N-I, -I no. <laughs> W-O-R-K. <laughs> and so, with money, with the money that we earn, we will provide for our families, relatives, and those, and help those in their time of need. Thus, we will not, we will not be dependent on anyone else, allowing us to win the respect of outsiders. You know, when I see young families, when I see single parents, when I see parents that are in one members in school and the sacrifice they're making so and learning new abilities i have a lot of respect for that because kim and i we sacrificed a lot to, everybody says oh look what you got look how yeah but you know you weren't there when i was living in a trailer house you weren't there when we were sacrificing. You weren't there when we lived in a little dingy apartment that nobody else would live in so that we could go to school. You weren't there when there wasn't no food in the house. Oh, but look at you now. You don't understand the sacrifice. And sometimes when we look out at people, we don't see how they got there. What we see is, oh, look what they got. They arrived. We need what they have. But it took us years to get to that place took some of you years to get to that place and so because of that we're no longer dependent because we've applied the word of god and used the talents and used the abilities that god's given us and grown and moved forward 
We now have gone from having to be the blessed, having people bless us, to being able to bless people. You see, I believe that God's people should be the most sought-after employees in the world. Don't you? And because of our commitment to God, God is our ultimate boss. We should be the most honest, hard-working employees who get along with others better than anyone else. And too often we're... we're we're, you know, we're the snibbling, we're the snobbing, we're the whinies. Man, sometimes we just need to suck it up. Well, you know how they treat me at work? <laughs> the Bible says that you're going to get treated wrongly. But God said that every, every tongue that would rise against you, he proved to be wrong. Man, you keep your heart right. You keep doing things behind the scenes, and I guarantee you, God will make sure that you get noticed and promoted and increased. Amen? Don't worry about what somebody else is doing. Don't worry about their promotions. Don't worry about, hey, you know, I, sh I should have got that. Now I'm going to be a rotten employee. I'm not going to, I'm just going to walk around angry and I'm going to just do what I have to do and I'm not going to do any more than what I have to do. Darn that, that boss. I'm going to show him. No, you keep doing what you do the best to your ability and you keep giving and God will make sure that there will come a day. He'll open a door that no man can open or close on your behalf and you'll walk right through and you're going to say, "Woo! I'm glad I didn't quit. I'm glad I didn't give up and I'm glad I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> That's good preaching, Pastor. I got hung up in a hair here. Golly. So, again, we do this and we honor God at work through our actions. Why? Because all this will bring glory to God. So let's review real quickly what we've come up so far. We've concluded so far that God owns everything, right? And God gives us the ability to work and earn an income. So the next we must keep money in proper perspective. We must keep money in proper perspective. The truth of the matter is that money is a necessity for life in this world, right? And because of that, uh, because of that, we must not be allowed to have money take over our lives. How many of you know it's very easy to have money take control of your life? Even though money, in essence, is just a medium of exchange, it can become a god. And... There's a very real and dark side to money that God warns us about repeatedly in Scripture. For instance, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 13, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then Jesus made this shocking statement another occasion in Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 and 24, when he said, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Then Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he says, People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunged men into ruin and destruction. Now, before I finish reading this, let me make this point. There's nothing wrong with having money. But when it becomes, we're talking about when it becomes your God. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and perceive themselves and pierce themselves with many griefs. But why is it that money has such power over us? Hmm? If you think about it, money has the characteristics that sometimes we attribute to deity, don't we? Money can carry with it security, freedom, power. Money encourages self-sufficiency and selflessness or selfishness. And also when a person pursues money as a primary thing, it's, it, it, you know, it's an uncontrollable desire. It can never be, it can never be satisfied. I got it. Got to have more. Got to have more. Got to have more. Ecclesiastics chapter 5 and verse 10 says, Whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. 
So one truth that, that we have to keep at the forefront of our thinking is that God is our God and that He is the source of our security and happiness. Not money. Not money. It's so easy to think that money is the key to life. Man, if I just had more, if I just, then I could buy a boat, I could buy a house, I could buy this, I could do that. But God is your source. And if you continue to follow after God, the things that, 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 that is in your heart will come to pass. He said, seek ye the first, the kingdom of God, right? And his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. So, it's so easy to think that money is the key to life. And it's so easy that if we just had enough money, then we wouldn't have to worry about anything. We could just enjoy life. Right? Just enjoy life and do the things we've always wanted to do. Like fish. Own a basketball team. And then, you know, if we had just enough money, we'd never have any problems, would we? No problems. You know, Ray Stedman was one of the foremost biblical ex expositors of the 20th century. You know, he ministered in Hollywood, Florida. And when he was there, it was called uh, the Gold Coast of Florida. Why? Because it had so much money. He said, every morning I, I taught the scripture to a crowd of 500 or more people who represented well over a billion dollars worth of accumulated wealth. I found that most of them, by their own testimony, though they had all the money to buy everything in the, anything in, they wanted, had arrived at the place where they were suffering from what someone had so aptly called destination sickness. And the problem of having everything is that you, want, that you want, but not wanting anything you have. You have everything you want, but not having anything that you have and being sick and empty and lonely and miserable because you can do anything you want to do. Wouldn't that be a good thing? <laughs> Many people love the chance to prove that money can't make them happy. Very sadly, unfortunately, we see the truth of that lived out week after week and year after year as we watch the rich and famous struggle with everyday life. Just because they have money, they still have problems in life. We watch as they are destroyed by their fame and fortune, or they find that fame and fortune don't lead to happiness. You know, some of the recent names that maybe come to mind might include, you know, people like Tiger Woods, Lindsay Lohan, Heath Ledger, Mindy McCready, and Robin Williams. All seem to have it all together, but did they? Then there are the countless stories of the big lottery winners who ended up in far worse shape than they were before they hit, hit it big. <laughs> I sometimes think I'd like to have the opportunity, though. You know, there's the gentleman Buddy Post, a former, former carnival worker and cook who won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery. Since he won the money, he's been con convicted of assault. His sixth wife has left him. His brother was convicted of trying to kill him to get his money. The gas has been turned off to the crumbling mansion he bought. And he feels lucky to have electricity and a telephone. But yet, 16.2 million. Then we have the couple from Texas. And they won 16, approximately $16 million as well. <clears throat> However, the big money exposed the 12-year-old marriage existing faults and created several new ones. For several years, they had been engulfed in a bitter divorce, divorce court battle over how much money each of them would get. Mrs. Nichols said, after the money, we had, bought, we had about one month of good times and about three years of misery. The money was a curse. It didn't help at all. The husband said, more than good has come out. Or more bad than good has come out of winning the lottery. You know, the very first person in our country to reach the status of a billionaire was a man who knew how to set goals and to reach them. At age 23, he had become a millionaire, and by the age 50, a billionaire. Three years later, at age 53, he became very ill. His entire body racked with pain. He lost all of his hair on his head. In complete agony, ag agony, in complete agony, he became, in complete agony, he could only digest milk and crackers, even though he could 
buy anything he wanted. As, as an associate wrote, he could not sleep, he could not smile, nothing in life meant anything to him. His doctors predicted that he, he would die within a year. As he waited his death to approach, he woke one morning with a vague remembrance of a dream. He could barely recall the dream, but he knew it had something to do with not being able to take any of his success or riches with him into the next world. He called his attorneys, accountants, and managers and announced that he wanted to channel his assets to hospitals, research, and mission work. And on that day, John D. Rockefeller established his foundation. The list of discoveries and good resulting from his choice is enormous. But perhaps the most amazing part of Rockefeller's story is that his decision to change his approach to his fortune saved his own life. He went from a man about to die at age 54 to a man who lived to be 98 years old. Truly, money must be kept in proper perspective. You see, there's so much for us to learn from God about money and its use. First and foremost, we need to learn that God owns everything. It's not ours. It's God's. Second, we need to learn that God gives us the ability to earn money and make a living, and He expects us to do so. Third, we need to learn that the pursuit of money must be kept in proper perspective. See, there's a lot of good things that money can be used for, but there are a lot of things that money cannot do. The most valuable things in life cannot be bought with money. Money can't buy happiness. Money can't buy peace. Money can't buy love. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like a good song, right? But the Beatles already wrote it. <laughs> money won't produce the ideal mate. Sure, try or fix a troubled marriage. And it certainly won't buy heaven. Money sometimes, though, can purchase a corn of hell on earth. So let's learn to value the things that money cannot buy. And uh, so what we'll be working on toward the short series is having a good spiritual perspective of money. We'll be looking to God to help us develop financial self-control, contentment, and unselfishness. And with God's help, we can learn to work hard and work well and then enjoy the fruit of our labor. And there's nothing wrong with that. And with God's help, we can learn to glorify God, expand his kingdom, and help others with the resources God places in our hands. Amen? God does not want money. God does not want your money. He just wants your heart. If you're watching this morning, through any one of our multimedia devices. I know I just went a few minutes longer than normal, but I thank you for staying hooked up. If you're watching through any one of our multimedia devices or here on campus and you never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I just want to give you that opportunity right now. God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. The Bible says that if we'll confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be born again, saved, however you want to say it, made whole. I want to give you this opportunity and with, with the congregation joining us in prayer. You've never I accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You don't have that knowing or that knowledge that if you were to die today, that heaven would be your permanent residence. I want to give you that. Join with me. Join with the congregation as we say a prayer and ask Jesus to become Lord of your life. Join with me this morning, congregation. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, become Lord of my life. I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that you were raised from the dead. Jesus, I now call you my Lord. Now, as a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to remind you that all your sins are forgiven. You are on your way to heaven. You know, I want to thank you so much, each and every one of you and those of you that are watching online for being with us here today. Make sure you stay connected with us here at His Grace Church throughout the week. And you can do that online at hgc.church, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, 3184. And if you're watching after the fact, please give this video a thumbs up. And uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Amen. We believe God has something unique to say to you today. And our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Father, we just thank you and bless you, and you're dismissed. God bless you.